Okay, welcome back. This is going to be our last video in our polynomial regression series. Uh, so as a reminder, we've now fit our linear, quadratic, cubic, and quartic models. The models kept getting better, uh, though in the last time we added a term, we didn't see really much improvement. Uh, so let's just ask what happens. If, so how, how would we keep going? So uh, one thing you might notice that adding more and more polynomial terms uh, is going to start getting uh, challenging manually in the sense that uh, you know, if I wanted to write uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, whatever order, I, I, my the actual equation I have to write is getting quite large. Uh, thankfully, there's a handy function called poly, uh, which for fitting for writing out polynomial equations. So here, x is our variable. 30 means I'm going to include all terms up to the 30th power. Um, and then I can see, I've kind of truncated some of it, but you can see our regressions, uh, our, our estimates of you know, kind of jump to a much higher order. I didn't, this is just for visualization purposes, uh, to make a point. Uh, when I fit 30 parameters to this data set, which I think had 40 data points, um, I'm now to the point where uh, I have 30 terms. It actually could not estimate 10 of them because of numerical singularities, which is kind of algorithm related issues. Uh, of the remaining 20, we don't actually see any of them being statistically significant. Um, that said, our overall model test p-value is still highly significant because while well, this model uh, is, uh, well, well, no individual parameter in this model is different from zero, the overall model is still better than uh, putting a, a flat constant mean. But clearly, we're spreading, you know, hints that we're spreading our information too thin. Um, but our R squared has gone up again, but you know, not by much because there wasn't really much left to go up by. Um, if we look at this model, uh, we see kind of what I would argue is kind of the classic uh, expectation for overfitting. You know, we are uh, clearly fitting wiggles instead of fitting, we're fitting to the noise rather than the, than the data. And so particularly you see at the high end here, uh, when x is large, you know, the, the model's going almost exactly through these last few data points. But to do so, like between the, uh, the, the point at you know, about 9 and the point about 10, you know, it's going to do some really weird wiggling uh, to get the, the line to go through these points. And you know, I don't know about you, but for me, if I were to make a point, prediction at 9.5, I wouldn't predict it to be negative, uh, even though that's what the model says. But at the same time, you can see the, the uh, model predictive interval and comps interval at that point are also quite wide. So the, the, the comps interval is now uh, getting much wider. We're getting a lot of wiggles in here. And again, we're getting kind of weird behavior at the extremes where, uh, you, know, we're, we're, you know, we see kind of no trend in the data. We see lots of little wiggles. And then to get to the last data point, a pretty large uh, departure that doesn't even show up on the graph. Cool. Um, that's not to say that the uh, 30th, 30th order polynomial fundamentally can't be fit to this data. Uh, this was done with a, a relatively small sample size. If I had that same underlying model but increased the sample size, you know, now to tens of thousands of data points, uh, I actually can get that 30th order polynomial to fit quite nicely without any weird departures, and that is because we now have a lot more data. And that, again, comes to the idea in model selection, uh, as your model gets more complicated, you need more and more data to support that. Or the other way to put it is that, that when you have more data, you can support more complicated models. Um, sample size is really important here in terms of, of model selection. Uh, so jumping back to our original smaller sample size, uh, we can now look at uh, the five models we considered, polynomials from one to four, and then jumping to 30. We can see a consistent pattern of our R squared going down. Uh, and we can see in, that initially our AIC goes down, uh, then it kind of levels off. Uh, and then our 30th order polynomial, the our, uh, AIC is gone back up again. So in this case, the, the penalty for um, adding all those terms 
outweighs the benefit that we get from adding them. <clears throat> One thing I would note in, is that in this particular case, with the, the, the various wiggles in the data, uh, the AIC, even though that fourth order polynomial included terms that were not individually statistically significant, uh, the overall model actually has a, a, a lower, the lowest AIC of the ones we considered. Uh, but that lower AIC is, is very marginally lower. So we can see that the AIC went down uh, by about 0.25. Um, and remember that we don't really distinguish models that have an AIC within a range of, of two. So the way you would actually interpret this is that while the fourth order polynomial is a slightly better fit than the third order polynomial, effectively you, you really couldn't tell them apart. Um, and in fact, if you were to make predictions, it might actually be value to make predictions with both models. Uh, and in some cases, like in the center of the data, they're probably predicting essentially the same thing. In other cases, at the extremes, they may predict very different things, and that would actually be a useful thing to know. The two models that fit, e you know, where do two models that fit equally well make the same prediction, and where do two models that fit the data equally well make very different predictions? Um, and then finally, to wrap up, this is just a, a visual comparison uh, between our uh, cubic model, which fit the data very well. And in this case, I never told you where this data came from, but this was actually simulated data all along. So I actually you know, stuck in a, a model that I made up, uh, made up the parameters, and simulated data from it, adding a certain amount of, of error around the, the, the model. Um, so I chose a, a standard error. And then, uh, sorry, I chose a, a sigma residual error. And then I fit that, and, and you can see that in this case, uh, the true model actually does fall within the comps interval of the recovered model. Uh, the parameter, you know, the recovered parameter estimates are not uh, perfect, uh, but they're in the right ballpark. And you know, if you you could go back and look at your comps estimates on any of the individual parameters to ask whether they actually were significantly different from the true model as well. Cool. So we'll wrap up there, and that kind of covers our our lecture on on how we fit. Uh, polynomial models and also kind of why we fit polynomial models and the importance of having model selection as a way of helping us know when to stop fitting polynomials. So that's going to wrap up that in the next video series we're going to talk about uh, interactions between our, our predictor models. So we'll go back to kind of multiple regression where we have multiple x's that aren't just the same thing squared and ask how we capture parameter interactions. <clears throat>